This is the man, the director of photography, the motion picture cameraman. His importance and influence are felt from the moment a motion picture begins to take shape until it is completed. Of necessity, he has mastered the many tools of a complex and demanding art. Cameras, a wide range of many kinds which vary in scope, limitations, and operations. I think if a worldwide group of cinematographers can meet and share their vision, which is obvious, they're, you know, we are cinematographers, but their passion as well, and the understanding that, that what we are contributing doesn't stop with, uh, at the film plane, you know, it goes beyond that. The creative spirit is part of a deliberate collaboration, not an accidental one. And uh, I think the pace at which films are made um, kind of crushes that, and you have to find it in those spare moments. And these, the, the international perspective is something that in some ways aligns me as a, a Canadian slash American cinematographer and um, helps me understand that the, the, the story can be told in different ways and with a, a different level of passion. Something so, uh, not bad. Uh, the dog is the best one we can have. My favorite. I think, I think it's historic what we're doing. It's a very quiet, small thing, but I think it has a may have a great, great impact. Uh, they call this sort of people-to-people -people diplomacy, you know, because we're, we're cha we change the world one relationship at a time. <laughs> we're here because the Academy is graciously hosting the ICSC 2011 Summit, and they're allowing us to use their facility. There is a solid state lighting seminar and there is a workflow seminar and a digital archiving seminar. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, good. <laughs> Next break won't be until 12.15, 12.30. So if you need to use the restroom, use it now. Also, you are sitting in a theater named after a cinematographer, the Linwood Dunn Theater. So it's, yes, Linwood Dunn, who created the effects for King Kong and Congress. Today we are hearing the standard studio tungsten light being characterized as a legacy light, revered by generations of cinematographers who grew up with it. Such a characterization suggests the appeal is familiarity, habit, and custom, a mere fashion that can be cast off in favor of a newer one. This is dismissive of the incredible effort that created the reliable light film imaging infrastructure that has served us so well for some 80 years. While there are obvious advantages to the LED in terms of economy, and it demonstrably has superb application as an effects light with its capacity for sophisticated controls, there are, however, problems with color rendering which hinder its adoption as a stage light. It's necessary to understand what produced the artifact seen in the experiment footage. If the color shifts were on a single axis, it would be possible to correct for them. But diverging as they do, there is little that can be done as a correction of one condition in one direction exacerbates other conditions. Of course, if at any time the director of photography consciously and deliberately selects any of these consequences, they are immediately transformed into art. It only remains an artifact if it was imposed by the technology. The ultimate goal is simply to ensure that a new technology, such as LEDs or plasma or whatever may lie in our future, actually advances the art form to a new level. In short, to make it work. To that end, we actively research the field of solid-state light, with the Academy's mission being the pursuit of excellence in the arts and sciences and motion pictures, which is usually most evident in our annual extravaganza known as the Oscars. It begins, as we have shown all the way back in 1928, with light, the raw material of our vision. So here is a brand new, brand new lamp this is a, just, a, just a very gratifying sign that out there in the light manufacturing world, uh, you know, somebody gets it. This is, the, this is the, by far the closest replication to a, uh, to a, a tungsten uh, spectral uh, output that, uh, that we've ever seen. Who makes that one? Yeah. <laughs> the light sources are identified only by number. Uh, our intent is not to 
uh, cast aspersions on one light source or another, simply to demonstrate that uh, even though lights uh, may appear uh, white to the eye, they have very different color reproduction properties. We don't know who are no, the we, manufacturers, we, but yeah, you send them to the manufacturers to yeah, know Yeah, well, exactly. as I say, we had, yeah. we had them, we saw them again at NAB, and, 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 uh, and they saw this uh, presentation at NAB. Um, and some of them are very appreciative. Mm -hmm. Others, hmm. they don't, you know, they, they've got a lot invested and they're going to keep pushing whatever that is. But some of them. Yeah. This is designed to work with tungsten light. With all these discontinuous spectrums, the, the uh, uh, spike of green no. could be totally inaccurate. So you can throw them away. Yes. The, 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 best tool, the best tool to use, well, even using your eye, because the sensitivity of the film is going to be different than the way your eyes perceive. The best tool these days is a spectroradiometer, so you can actually get a histogram of the color. And you said that one basically yeah. got it. Yeah. So then, but, but but they were among the people that a year and a half ago were. Oh my God, what are, what are you doing? But they went home and they thought about it and they thought, okay. And they made the you know, we, we, we solve that problem, mm -hmm. and, and they worked on it. And so, if we, if we get them all to do that. Uh, you yeah, know, we'll have a great. standard just like Tungsten, just like uh, you mentioned. We would, we would hope so. You could see where, okay, all the colors are shifting toward magenta, but as you rock away from magenta, they won't all move together. They, all, they won't all move together, they'll move in different directions. Okay. So as the colors shift, see, there's no way to just bring it back in. You can't just color correct it in one direction. It, it starts to, because you correct the greens and the magentas will shoot way out of the line. You bring the magentas back in and you start to rest. So you, you'll do, and you can't do that with every shot on the color correction. So, you know. The lighting presentation is extremely interesting and important, but what they're trying to do is practically impossible. With all the different cameras, the artificial lens of the camera, and the recording system they use, uh, film, uh, how it's projected, how it's transferred, uh, it, it's an impossibility. You could. So you do the best you can with it, and uh, as we have for all these years, even tungsten uh, uh, light, as the bulbs get older, they change color temperature. Uh, so it, it, I've enjoyed the uh, presentation, but I'm skeptical. <laughs> Golden, golden award in Berlin or what do you want to do? <laughs> I got the greatest shot of him yesterday. It begins on his ponytail. And I, cr I crane up on the ponytail and go up and around to his face. <laughs> just like a... And then he says something. <laughs> Garrett Smith, he knows, he knows more about old films and new films than anybody they ever had at Paramount. And, they, and he's sort of the resonant ancient hippie. When he walks away, you'll check his ponytail. We've all been discussing for a period of time, including in the last few days, the eroding of the role of the cinematographer. And we at the Academy care about that, and we're putting in a lot of effort to try to develop tools that will allow professionals to do their craft in a very professional way. The democratization of this stuff allows anyone who has uh, access to the tools to show whether or not they have talent, but basically it's another story as to how the professionals with talent are provided a mechanism to take imagery to the next generation and to the next level. We'll, we'll give you a, a chance, a little crack in the door of looking through at what we see, where this might go, and why we're really trying to uh, bring these tools to bear. And we think there's great promise and in the fact that now that people have to deliver masters that are going to serve multiple purposes, that instead of taking something that has been turned down to 2,000 to 1 dynamic range as a starting point, to be able to go to something that has all the creative intent built in, but has high dynamic range and broad color gamut and repurpose from that into the, the output display mechanisms opens up a whole new way of approaching remastering and repurposing material. The data is actually in the master. The, the display can't take advantage of all of the data that's in the master. And in the process of, of rendering, choices need to be made about which portions of, of the scene are going to be reproduced. So all the creative choices were made while looking at a 709 output, but 
the data that was being manipulated was manipulated in a full dynamic range environment. It gives a real taste of what we think high dynamic range imagery is going to bring to the table. All of what we're trying to do with all of these various bits and pieces is to put you in a very favorable starting point for the next steps of the process, to do it faster, quicker, easier, and without the heroic efforts that these things have taken in the past. Can you tell me a little bit about your your feelings as a cinematographer utilizing the system well, now? It feels like there's a, there's more latitude, there's more dynamic range. I, I spend no time at all in a dip station. Um, I mean, you're moving so quickly from location to location, <coughs> even if you're you're shooting in the same area, you still have to move a tent with all these monitors. And it all comes back to that when I shot a, uh, a film for Jesse Dillon called How High um, about nine and a half years ago, and uh, I lit the scene to my eye. I went back to the monitor and it looked awful. I had no, I, I just, I couldn't believe what it looked like. So I began to direct uh, the gaffer and grip uh, as far as window exposure, etc. Um, from the monitor, and it started to look great on the monitor. I went back to the set, and it looked like hell again. And I just, I thought, okay, now, how do I like this? Do I just stay by a monitor, or, or do I do what I normally do, which is, you know, I stay by a camera all the time. Um, this is the first time where actually I, I felt comfortable with being next to a camera and kind of getting what I thought you know, I should be getting. Engineers have this tendency that if there's a way to make the output of their product look good, they think they've done the job. They don't understand how it actually has to fit in and be practical and do the other stuff. So what we're trying to bring to it is bridging between what we know these capabilities of these devices are and an understanding of the workflow and to try to separate the laboratory processes from the creative processes. Every laboratory, every post facility in the world has their own secret sauce. And uh, uh, that, that differentiates them, they think, on a commercial basis. I don't think so. Actually, more and more of them realize that it's not. The question, I think, has to do with standardizing. Um, will this work? That's my question to Ray, which I think, you know, which would be the goal. I would be the last one to say that what we've designed will take into account all the new issues and all the new creative aspects that come to play. But I think without putting in place something like this and a solid foundation, too much of our effort is not going into value up on the screen. We're putting too much of it into the laboratory processes. And that's what, this, this is supposed to make all of that easier and to basically allow the creativity to flourish again. To have the DIT's role be to make sure that what you were doing got captured correctly, that there were no drive errors, card errors, other aspects, but to put the creativity back into the hands of the cinematographer and, 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 and move away from this concept that somebody else is the author of the images, that they're setting the creative look or any of the rest of it. You know, that's my personal goal in what it is that we're trying to do here. So far, we have not had a single PP that's actually done a project through this that hasn't been ecstatic with the overall results. Know that much. As a tool, this is an absolutely workable solution and uh, delivers an amazing consistency day to day, and my hat is off to you, Francis. Stuff. I go into this demo of Curtis, yeah. and I'm looking, okay, the raw, and then they show develop. And I'm noticing things like the top of lamps that have like a tobacco little paint on it are blowing, yeah. or, the, or the marquee is like overexposed. But you know, we're talking about half no stops. And, yeah. and I'm going, where is it? What happened? What yeah. happened? And he said, oh, I'll get that. So they go to Encore and they bring their scientists in from Sony Electronics, New Jersey. And they, Encore was smart enough to say, okay, 
we'll teach me. We'll listen. Yeah. And they develop the workflow. If you do a DPX type thing, you're going through some form of film print lot to go from printing density out. And if you go through a film print lot that matches a lab, you're limited to the color reproduction capability of of film. Yeah. Okay. Film does not like bright saturated colors it's a subtractive system to get saturated colors they have to be dark i don't do color correction on the set anymore i just want to have the monitor that delivers exactly what i see on the monitor that's what we get whatever happens afterwards it has to be right so you never saw on the monitor what we the iff every everything happens in the post production yes so you're basically working off a rec 709 monitor still I don't know what the hell he had. That's a 709. He had a bunch of, yeah. a bunch of crap. And it was all like cabled and the cables were all fucked up. And I, I, it was a joke. And his LUTs, all the LUTs, I threw away. Sure, no, but they I mean, peel to, off to use this will, system, it's basically just a different way to read the data. We're, we're holding a lot of that. The out, holding the outside and yeah. inside. Yeah. The original tender yeah, that, workflow. That's, that's the frame right there. Yeah, lost yeah. yeah. and, and, and my video, it doesn't hold. Well, well watch this. I can, I can bring it down. I can bring it down here, so you, now, now it should hold. Yes, yeah. See, that's, that's, the, that's, that's acceptable. What, what we're shown there drove me nuts. Uh -huh. you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a big issue, is preserving that highlight headroom, you know. You can crush it later, but if you crush it first, what are you going to do, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry, Gary, but we have to go back in. Oh, you do? Well, oh, I'll set up again later at the next break. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. I'm back again later. Okay, thank you. You want your images to be seen in 25 or 50 or 100 years, as Michael asked earlier. Anyone disagree with that? <laughs> Some of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Moving image which is features and documentaries and recorded sound, are our cultural, visual, and oral heritage. Some of the tools you're using, however, and indeed this headlong rush into the digital production, presents a lot of problems. The key issue was presented, as Andy pointed out, in the Academy's original report called The Digital Dilemma, which is that with all the benefits of the digital systems, there was and is no guaranteed long-term access. And preservation without access is useless. Well, much has been written and talked about the creative advantages of film, but is it a perfect medium? By no means. As you all know, film is fragile. From nitrate self-ignition potential through cellulose acetate and the vinegar syndrome through the early Eastman color fading. We've had our problems with film. But as well as there are advantages to the new digital equipment systems, the major issue is that film has given us a proven long-term access. We must generate awareness about the incredible contribution that film, the celluloid itself, has made to humanity, and that it is time to elevate this material to the rank of world heritage. Through film, we have documented our time in an unprecedented manner. It is indeed the face of our humanity and the Rosetta Stone of our time. This medium of expression must be cherished and protected. Film has captured us in an unparalleled manner that must not be forfeited for the sake of technological advances and economic gain. There's a term that uh, I don't know how many of you have heard called born archival. Anybody hear that term before? That's really important, especially as you move more into digital capture technologies. If you don't capture that metadata on the set and right up at the beginning, you will never recreate it all the way at the end. And we spent eight months, we were able to find the people that actually created all this content and interview them. They still remembered enough about the process where we were able to collect enough to properly catalog the materials in the collection. This building here at the Academy is connected to this fiber optic network and all those lines uh, show the connections between the various research and education networks in the participating institutions. Our digital present is, present is such a small part of the reality of image creation that, uh, that we have had in our history. And what I wanted to do today is show you two images that walk us deep back into our analog art past. Two images that I think are crucially important uh, in the history 
uh, of image creation and to us as cinematographers. And the first one is a painting, if we could just show that. This painting was rejected as not being important. It was very dirty. Its attribution to Caravaggio had been lost, and it was thought to be a bad copy of a copy of a lost painting of Caravaggio done by a Dutch painter who was a follower of Caravaggio's named uh, Gerard Honthorst. Honthorst. Essentially, the painting was never lost. The painting went from one place to another. The object was there. What was lost was the metadata. They discovered the metadata. They discovered the metadata because it was on paper, paper that had survived, had been passed down, had been stored for 400 years. The next thing I want to show you is a photograph. This is the oldest photograph uh, it was made. It was, uh, it was made in uh, September of uh, 1824 by Nisiphor Nieps. It's a view from the second story of his family residence in the Loire Valley, looking out the studio window. One of the real concerns I think we should have as filmmakers is how vulnerable the materials we're creating today, especially if they're born digital. What's going to happen to them? And to what extent we can and should be able to be involved with the archivists and the preservationists that are essentially empowered and mandated to preserve this material. And I, for one, up until a couple of years ago, had no contact, no awareness with this whole part of image preservation. And I would encourage all of you to take you know, serious awareness of this and do anything you can on an ongoing basis to help preserve the film history, the image history in your own country, and of course your own work. Our job is to focus on that circle of value, to try to save the things that we believe, and we might be wrong, and you might hate us for it in the end. Why didn't we just save those outtakes from Citizen Kane? Grover actually is the one who burned them. But the fact is, we can't second guess that. I was even born. That's right. <laughs> It was a remarkable feat. But the fact is, we cannot save everything, not even in the studios. We know you can't save everything. And I would also say that I have been on the other side of the formula as an archivist for independent and avant-garde filmmakers. And it, I, I understand the problem, but not everything has value, and not everything should be saved. We, at this present moment, are probably the worst people to decide what should be saved and what shouldn't be saved. But in de facto, that's exactly what we're doing because we only have a survival window on materials, unless they're migrated, if they're born digital, of only five years. We're already losing materials. Some of the stuff, maybe it's okay it's lost. But at this point, how can we know from our current vantage point what should and should not be saved? And Citizen Kane is a, is a case in point. This is with a film that was relegated to the dustbin of history for like 30 years. And uh, its rehabilitation is, is one of the five great films ever made, has really only been something that's happened in the last 15 or 20 years. That film, had it been born digital, probably would have never survived. We, we always think about, well, okay, film, it's wonderful, it's a great medium, it's so easy to save it, blah, blah, blah. We didn't save most of our films that way. We lost lots of original negative. We lost a huge strata of quality. You know, people say, okay, we've lost The Patriot. That film no longer exists. But that's not the primary kind of loss with film. The primary kind of loss is that loss from generation to generation to generation as the cinematography of you know of of your great you know your great people in the 20s is now reduced to a dupe of a dupe and you don't see the sharpness you don't see the contrast range that's the loss that's the real loss of cinema as much as when we lose an entire film like the patriot and what digital at least offers us theoretically you can argue whether we can do it or not and whether migration is economically possible, but what digital offers is to be able to retain the data at that original level for much more than a hundred years, whereas you cannot do that with film. We have in our possession four feature-length documentaries from, from which one is an Oscar-nominated film. 
that um, report the lives of uh, people. And for example, we want to go back to um, to their lives making and to follow up uh, what happened to them. Uh, so we have to uh, keep track, we have to archive that. Now, I have not the possibility to do that. I have at home at uh, this moment, um, I get, I think, 26 terabytes of, uh, of uh, material that um, is raw material that is can be used in a later form, but not so much as that. But, so what do you do with it? If you can duplicate it as many times as possible, that's a really good way to ensure at least there's more than one copy around. Um, even if that's a hard drive, a tape, and, and some service you can find, you know. Um, that just duplicating it and keeping multiple copies of it is, is one way to approach a situation. And those are a, a lot of different cost structures that are out there. So that I don't think there is one single cost for digitally archiving. But also parallels experience that uh, I've had with some of my documentary filmmaker friends that, you know, they, they make these films, they have very limited, if any, distribution. They do not have any of the facilities uh, that, you know, say are backed up by a major studio or something like that. In fact, they have no archiving facilities at all. And, you know, whereas when we were making documentaries in a film uh, realm, in a celluloid realm, we had the whole concept of benign neglect. That, I mean, if you stored the negative and your elements in, in, in a, a somewhat responsible style, they were going to be around for a good part of your career. But we have so many documentary filmmakers now, they make the film, they, they have their masters or whatever. A lot of cases, and I know this to be true, they actually have them on a bookshelf in their living room, yep. subject to the vagaries of, of temperature and humidity and things like that, because they have neither the money to do any kind of archiving and the imperative they have that is driving them more than anything else, which is to raise money to do their next film. How much costs? average film here in the United States in the studio system to save it for the ar archive and do you have your own facility to do that there or you, or, or are you hiring it on the money process uh, you know third party uh, you know providers to, to do the, all, the, all the stuff. Well, I'm not quite sure how to answer it because the cost change like daily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's a cost to create the YCMs, which are considered, I think, an archival thing. It's cost to um, ensure that you have the digital materials backed up in some way. Those costs are, you know, across the board. If you've got an internal infrastructure like I sort of have and like Sony has a little bit more of, those costs can sort of float between. But it's a very good question. How much does it cost? really to archive and we're we're looking at that now too. There are probably more people talking about the preservation problem now than there's ever been before. Before when as you were talking about like it, 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 there was nobody doing something at some of the studios now it's totally on the table and it's being brought up and it's being discussed so it's a larger set of issues. Here he is, right here. <laughs> no, I want you to know that all of my documentary crew really listen carefully to your your thoughts and your remarks about about right, Pim. <laughs> and so we wanted to say on on digital what you said in public here a few minutes ago, and for our for our favor. Okay. Okay. <laughs> what, what would you like me to, to cover? The, the uh, documentary part of the report? Yeah, talk to Tamara. Okay. Yeah. So basically, um, we understand that documentarians are independent filmmakers, but they have a separate set of issues. Number one, they generally deal in the nonfiction narrative area. Number two, their primary customers are cable and television, uh, except for the few theatrical features, uh, you know, the Michael Moore type stuff, and those that qualify for the Academy Awards. So the real issue with the documentarians that we looked at out of the three organizations, which was the Academy's documentary branch, the Television Academy's nonfiction branch, uh, and the International Documentary Association, we did our surveys with them and we said, what are the problems that you're facing with digital? And we were so surprised at the answers. Number one, uh, they love the fact that they can use the digital um, cameras because it means smaller, they can be hidden if they have to go into places where you don't want to be camera crew. You don't have sound problems, you don't need a separate sound man a lot of the times. 
Um, it also allows them to go into the digital distribution much easier. They can edit on desktops and so on and so forth. The, at this at this particular point, the only recommendation that we have is to film out. Despite what Michael Friend said, uh, it is the only long-term preservation medium that we have, which is film. And to be able to take your master material and go back out to film, uh, and it's going to become less expensive than it is now. You at least have a record that you can use until we solve this digital dilemma and come up with the permanent record, a bubble chip, or whatever it turns out to be that's non-erasable, lasts for 100 years, and has all those qualities. The thing that bothered us about the documentarians, who for the most part use historical footage, is that they didn't realize that if they, in 25 years, come back to this period of time, there will be no footage, because it's not lasting long. An example, which I didn't talk about today, but if you take a look at what's happened to the television newsreels, in the mid-80s they went to electronic news gathering, ENG. They put it on videotape because it was cheaper, and Bob Fisher's the one that talked about that. All right, so what they have now is all of the cities around the country that are celebrating their 150th, 175th anniversary. They go to find footage, and for the last 25 years, there's a black hole. There is nothing. The news departments have maybe a few obituaries and maybe, like the sports networks, the play of the week, and that's about it. And that's sad. The question of who is saving for what, and when the archival aspects come from those who believe that something might be commercial uh, may rob us of some historical value which exists now that we who live now uh, don't realize. So the question of who saves what, not just how, is a critical cultural issue. And uh, I don't know the answer to that, but that is one idea of what you save that's reproduced. And um, I hope I'm one of them. I am reproduced, my mother. Thank you. Okay. It's very well organized. They know how to speak to the public. It's, it, they work a lot. It's, uh, and the different guys we speak with, one speaks with very po poetic yes. uh, expressions, yes. the one who speaks yes. about Guillermo Navarro. Yes. Yes. You know, yes. I said yes. what yes. I said, you yes. know, I was, yes. but the way he was speaking uh, about that kind of thing can be boring was, mm. was very interesting. I was very surprised. We, we are, in Denmark, we are in a process to invent a completely new thing where you put all the data on the film and then, then you can you can do as many digital uh, copies you want, and they will all be alike. So the film is not dead. No, no, black and white is still ah. alive. <laughs> it's bla black and white. It's black. It, they print the, the the digital numbers on black and white, and these numbers tells the machine what the, the film looked like. It's like punch card. Yes. You know, it's yes, like, yes, it's like yes, you, yes, you punch card yes, uh, yes, in, in uh, the, yeah. the, the beginning of yeah. computing. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're very serious in, in, in the work. And, and I know that um, uh, Nordic Film in Copenhagen are taking part of it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things is happening on the lab there. Why didn't you say that? Well, you could have made some advertisement because, for, for because, your yeah, country. Yeah, yeah, but they don't they don't want anyone to talk too much about it. Ah, okay, so you know that I think... It, it oh, it's not... Uh, The uh, International Cinematographers Conference. It's been very interesting because what you find out is that if you're a cinematographer, you're a cinematographer. Uh, you are the you are your job, and so it's. You always think there are, you know, differences in different places that you've never been, but that's really not true. It's always, it's always the same. I, I just think it's interesting to know other people who do the craft and the art, 
you know, I think that's the most valuable thing. It's like the ASC, the most valuable thing is that is that we get to talk to each other because being, you know, a cinematographer is, is an art form that is, uh, uh, you know, a very kind of insular, insular thing. You're the only one who kind of knows what it's going to look like beforehand and what you need to do to execute it and, and those things. So it's not a conversation you have with other people on the crew, the director, the producer, or anybody else. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's something that they would want to understand, but they don't really understand. So it's good to talk to other cinematographers who you know, have the same aspirations and, and the same problems and sometimes some really great solutions. I remember that my father told me, my father was still alive by the way, uh, told me three things always. He says, you cannot um, demand respect, but you can command respect. And that respect, I feel, goes to the heart of what a lot of our struggles are at this point in time in the industry with the changes that are happening and with the people that we're dealing with who control what goes into production, who control how it gets distributed and exhibited. And uh, the second thing my father said is, is, in a meeting, don't speak unless you actually have something to say, which you know I always took to heart when I went into meetings, especially with people who uh, were in positions of power. And the third thing he told me is always dress nicely if you're going into a meeting with, with people you want something from or people who want something from you, because they will automatically, automatically assume uh, a, that you know more than you may actually do. Uh, B, that you have more power than you may actually have. And, and C, they will think that you are the smartest person in the room. There are some of us here uh, who are very fortunate to work with, uh, uh, with good big directors who, who appreciate the craft of cinematographer. Um, however, uh, there are a lot of them who do not, who even like look at us as a threat. Um, I do not have a solution for that except two things. One, dialogue. They have to be brought to the meetings like this, where they would be presented with the situation, uh, where they would be presented with the fact, how are we going to enhance what they want to do? Um, uh, that's number one. And then the, the, the thing number two, also even more important, uh, educating the new generations. What we have now problem in the Czech Republic is that a lot of the young people, the people that work on the foreign uh, projects in Czech Republic, they are saying, well, why, are we, you know, why are we supposed to join, you know? Well, what, what will you do for us, you know? We, you don't have any power, you don't, you, you don't have anything. We have this job from Americans, but we don't need you, you know. A lot of uh, American films shot in Prague, you know, and uh, there is as well a lot of commercials shot by other DPs from around the world, you know, they came to Prague. And what I was thinking is it will be nice to that if there can be a memo from, from the local uh, association of cinematographers in that country, if somebody, if, if somebody of their members goes abroad, he will be contacted the local uh, association of cinematographers there? It's absolutely uh, correct that uh, when uh, a member of a cinematography society is, is filming in another country and visits uh, that cinematography society, it, it makes a huge impact. What my aim is, if that will become such a thing that will be on a regular basis, the people that are not in the association yet, they want to join that to be, you know, to be acknowledged that uh, a famous cinematographer from the United States comes there and they, he starts to communicate with the local association and then the other Cinematographers that they are not there will try, try to join the local ones, that, which will which will make more power for the local one to join all the cinemas together. You know, it would be a very good idea if such a seminar uh, would be made not only for cinematographers but for the young directors. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Because in school, and I'm I'm. I'm I'm, I'm teaching in school at the directorate department. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> not, not cinematography department, and I'm teaching them cinematography. You're teaching directors cinematography? Yes, uh -huh. they, are, they are looking at the cinematography department guys, and they are looking for the strongest ones, the, be the best ones. Of course. Those who deliver the, the strong emotions to the stories, right? But now, to enhance that understanding uh, uh, would be great, because that would set the right path for them in the future. I think the conversations with the directors is very important. Those are our collaborators. We are their collaborators. We need to reinforce that the, car that the cinema is a visual style. And we take the visual side from the very beginning of the production to the very end of post-production. And there are other people who will help us, but we will take it from zero to hundred all the way through. When I'm shooting an image, making a film, I walk away from it for a while until I hopefully can get back into the DI or the final work on it. And I find that the editor is now reframing shots. The producers are changing things. And the director sometimes does it, sometimes it's done even without his knowledge. If the director does it, you say, okay, I have to, you know, he's my boss in a sense, and I'm making him just for him. And if he changes his mind later, he wants something different, it's his prerogative. But I find it, it very offensive when editors start changing your shots. They zoom in because, and then they convince, they're sitting in a room with the director for three, four, five months at a time. And they've been looking at, some, and the editors also will, and it's not just a tirade against editors, but it happens in all uh, aspects of our business. They'll sit at their Avid or whatever, Final Cut Pro, and they'll do coloring there. And they get so used to, the directors and the producers get so used to seeing that image that they have manipulated, that when you get it to do your final, they go, how come it doesn't look like it, it, you know, why doesn't it look like I've been looking at it? I really love how I've been seeing it. I find that it's, it, it, part of it is, is technology, is our enemy as well as our friend. If anything, we could come away from this, uh, this uh, forum uh, with a resolution to say that you can't treat cinematographers like that. You can't lock them out of the DI process. Okay, it might be a different. You may not get paid, but that's another that's another issue. But they should have the right to finish their work because they've only just started their work, and it's 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 not finished until you, until you deliver a print. We've come here with great intentions, but we can't go away and leave it all to the ASC. They're not the magic panacea for this. This room is the pan is the is the way that's going to happen. Is the medicine to fix this, yeah. and so I would hope that we don't necessarily annoy the Christ out of Michael and annoy the Christ out of the ASC, but perhaps we do it collectively and then pass it on to the ASC for their input as well. The only difference between us uh, cinematographers and uh, whoever comes in in different phases is that we have to be involved from the beginning to, till the end. So I think this is one of the things that can be communicated that cinematographer like a director is involved in a project from the beginning to the end. So I propose uh, in this summit maybe the, the final part of this summit could be forming a network of societies of cinematographers. And these societies who are here are already represented in this network. And uh, the governing body doesn't have to be an organization, it can be a circulating one society circulates every year. And at first, it doesn't have to be very, very ambitious. It can be, as we, as we spoke quarterly, information about what is going on. But the main thing, as Ron said, is that we don't walk away, but there is some kind of communication which goes on from that end. The world of cinematography today is not the world of, of all the image. So we have to separate and to understand what is our, our work, our world, and what is, what is the world of this image who are covering the, the world. And for me, what is important is when we work, we are not working alone. We are building something with a director, with a crew, uh, with our director, and this 
this is a, a journey, this is a travel, and this is not only a picture. So I think the respect comes with the respect we have for ourselves and for the, the crew and the world we are, we are living with. She's right, I, I agree with her, although we need to use the, the means that other people or other Anybody that wants to gain you know, attention uses, you know, what you want to call it, PR or whatever they use to get the attention. We have to use the same things, otherwise we will just not be heard. We can say the most truthful, uh, the most beautiful truth, but if there is seven billion lies on top of that, our truth would not be heard. It still will exist, but it's not going to be heard. Two years ago, I went to the Turner Classic Movie Festival where they showed a collection of mostly old movies and they got a huge number of attendees uh, from everywhere and, and they had producers and they had huge directors, they had big stars attending, they got an enormous amount of press and they showed old classic movies. And I was thinking, okay, well that's, that's how you make something like that work. You align yourselves with the organizations that have all that power and all that money and all those contacts, you know, in the industry that you're in, and and you get them all on the same page about what it is that you're trying to do, and what it is that you you're doing, and and the the association I think we were forging with the uh, the Motion Picture Academy is is kind of an example of, of the kinds of uh, advantages you can you can take or you can have when you associate yourself with other people in the industry. You know, I arrived on Saturday and I read an article in the LA Times about fire ants. And uh, in the article it said that a single fire ant can float. So, in the case of flood, the fire ant will drown. But uh, each single fire ant has some ability to uh, uh, stick to each other by claws and by their feet and form a raft. And that raft floats. So uh, physically this is possible because underneath the raft there is some air gathered and the raft floats. So, but what is most uh, interesting in this raft is that it has a collective uh, awareness. And of this collective awareness, no single hand knows nothing about. And what this in practice means, that if an obstacle comes against the raft, the raft will immediately deform itself and continue floating. And this came to my mind last night, no, last morning when I woke up at 3 o'clock. <laughs> 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 and I was uh, uh, thinking that actually Michael and dear colleagues and ASC, when you uh, were in inviting us to this seminar, that actually you are calling together a raft of cinema <laughs> and, and therefore I would like that uh, we all stand up, join hands and form a raft of cinema <laughs> <laughs>